So we've been studying how magnetic vector potential and magnetic field come from a current distribution. So when you, if you start with a current distribution J, you can get the magnetic vector potential, and from the magnetic vector potential, you can get the magnetic field. But where does the J come from? Where does this current density actually come from? Uh, sometimes we create current density using wires. So sometimes we set up explicitly what the current distribution is going to be. We call these free currents because we freely determine where they go. But sometimes the currents arise naturally in a material. We call these bound currents because the charge is flowing within the material, but it can't leave the material because the charge is moving around inside of the material, but it's not allowed to leave the material. So it is bound to stay inside of our magnetized material. We call this magnetization. Here's the picture. You have a material let's say you have a cylinder, where the electrons are free to move about and you turn on an external magnetic field. So you place the sample inside of a magnetic field. That's going to induce a current based on the right hand rule that's going to induce a current as the electrons move around inside the sample. Well, electrons moving about in a circle creates a current. So you end up with a current density inside there. You didn't explicitly set up a current density. All you did was turn on a magnetic field. And so it induced some current in here that creates a bound current density. What this will do is create two sets of current densities. It's going to create one on the interior. It will create a J, a volume current density, current per cross-sectional area of the curl of the magnetization vector. So the, you are setting up a magnetization vector in here. Whereas on the surface, you create a surface current density, K bound, current per cross-sectional length, that's equal to the magnetization vector crossed with n hat. n hat is the unit vector that is normal to the surface. So it's going to point in a different direction at each surface. At the top and the bottom here, it's going to point up or down. And along the round edge, it's going to point cylindrically outward here. So it's these two pieces that are going to go into your current density here that will determine the magnetic vector potential and then determine the magnetic field B. So to implement magnetization, we're going to use the Shapley library again. Most importantly, we're going to use the polygon function, which creates a polygon with the corners that we specify here. So I've specified four corners here uh, to get us a nice rectangle, just to get us a little bit of asymmetry to the problem. Uh, we're going to define our magnetization here. Uh, this is going to be our magnetization vector. Again, it's only non-zero when you're within the shape. So then the shape will have a magnetization vector that points up and not along the x-axis. And otherwise, it's going to be zero outside of that shape. So we're using the uh, shapely within function here to determine whether this point that we're looking at is within the shape that we defined up here. And the rest proceeds pretty much like what we've seen before. Uh, because our magnetization vector is pointing in the xy plane, our magnetic vector potential is only going to point along the z axis. So we're only worried about z components for A, so we're not having to keep track of x and y components, which is nice. We define our grid like we've done many times before. And here we're going to figure out what our J bound is. So we're going to initialize it to be zeros everywhere, and then we're going to add to those values. So we're going to loop over the X and Y values in our grid. Uh, we are assigning those the names X and Y, just so we don't have to keep typing X list and Y list. Uh, we're looking at the point P. And so we're looking if P is within shape, uh, then we are going to the right a little bit, we are going to the left a little bit, we're going above a little bit, we're going below a little bit. So we're going one step in each of those directions. And we're calculating the derivative of the uh, magnetization vector. Now you notice we're mixing the y and the x here. So we're taking the derivative of the y component with respect to x 
and the derivative of the x component with respect to y. That's how we're going to get the curl. So we've got, uh, we're changing the x value here of the y component, and we're changing the y value here for the x component. We have a minus sign in here to get us the derivative. We have another minus sign in here to get us the curl because the curl goes uh, in cyclic permutation order. So you got x, y, z, z, y, x. Uh, going in reverse order gets you a negative. And then we're gonna look for whether the point overlaps the shape. So are we on the edge of the shape? Because if so, then we need to get the surface current density. That's gonna be our K bound. And so we just loop over the various edges. So we're looping over each of the edges of the shape and we're looking for whether uh, we are along that edge, whether we're straddling that edge. If so, we calculate in hat. Uh, that's the same way we did it for polarization before. And then we calculate our surface bound current density as the cross product between the magnetization vector and in hat. So that's why you've got zero multiplying one and the one component multiplying the zero component here. The rest follows exactly like we've done before. There's really no difference between this next chunk of code and the stuff we did in the previous video. We're looping over our finite difference equation. We get uh, an A that is high on one end and low on the other end. Again, remember this is pointing up in the positive or negative Z direction. We can then use the curl to calculate the magnetic field just like we did before. So we're calculating the B field here. Now, because A is going in the Z and negative Z direction, B is gonna point in the XY plane. So in general, B is gonna point in the same general direction as the magnetization. It might point exactly in the same direction. It might point anti-parallel to it. Uh, but what we get out is this for our magnetic field. So we've got our magnetic field pointing along here in the center of the object. Remember, we are going, we have a width going from negative one to one and a height going from negative three to three. So you can imagine or visualize our, uh, our magnetized object, our bar magnet here. And you get exactly what you expect for a bar magnet. The magnetic field is going along parallel inside the center and then it's looping back around. So you're getting this nice dipole effect, right? You've always got to have a dipole for a magnetic field. You can't ever have a, a, a monopole formation. You can't ever have it spreading out. It's got to curl around back in. And so you can play around with each of these properties. You could change the shape of this magnetic, of, of this magnetization vector. Uh, you can also change the direction of it. So let's suppose this thing pointed in the X direction. Maybe it was a really long uh, bar magnet, uh, uh, you know, where the magnetization was pointing perpendicular to its longest edge. So our magnetic vector potential is rotated compared to how it was before. Now it's high along the, uh, the, the perpendicular edges compared to where it was before. Come down here to get our magnetic field. We'll calculate it and then we'll graph it. So we expect this interior part to basically rotate by 90 degrees. And lo and behold, that is what we get. So now, Remember, you've got the shape, the, the, the shape is still taking up the same boundary, right? It's still going uh, along this edge here. The difference is now that the magnetic field is pointing uh, along the short edge as opposed to the long edge. And you really get to see what is happening at the poles here. You really get to see the magnetic field curling around the, around the edges there, which is really neat. So that's a little exploration of how you can visualize magnetic fields. I know this is this is probably the most complicated piece of, a, of, a, of an undergraduate E&M course is visualizing all these fields. I hope that's helpful as you learn about this great stuff in E&M.